Thanks for joining us on Maple Springs Online. I'm Pastor Bill, and we're just glad to welcome you here into our home this weekend. I hope that you've had a, a good week. There might have been bumps along the way, but I hope you've had a good week, and I hope you're ready to worship God with us. The mission at Maple, just so you know, is we're on a path to help other people in their relationship with Jesus walk closer to Him and get to know Him more. 
I don't know where you're at in that path. But we invite you today to kick off your shoes, enjoy this service, and worship God with us, and get to know the one that we consider our friend, our Savior, and most importantly, our Lord and King. So thanks for joining us this morning. Welcome to Maple. take some time to offer up some prayer and, and praise. We thank God for all the things he's done for us. And, you know, the Bible teaches us in that Lord's Prayer, uh, not the one we're, we're studying in John 17, but the one that he prayed, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We're, we're taught to start off and, and, and think about God and his holiness and his, his magnificence. And so I would encourage you as we, we go into this time of prayer, um, think about what God has done. I think there's so many times we get on the negative side or we get on the needy side of life, and we are needy people. I'm not trying to discourage you on that one. But thank God. Thank God today if you don't have the COVID-19. Thank God if you're uh, still able to, uh, <coughs> to eat. Um, I was thinking about this, uh, and, and if you've never been outside of the United States, you, re you really won't understand how wealthy you are and how blessed you are with all the things you have. And so I thank God for all the blessings, even the great weather. I know people have complained about it being too cold. Well, it's getting hot now. And so uh, I'm sure in just a couple of weeks we'll have people complaining about how hot it is and we can never win. But you know what? God is a God of mercy. He's a God of grace, and we thank him for that. In the way of prayer requests today, and, and <clears throat> I hope you had a great Mother's Day. We, uh, we were enjoying ourselves last week celebrating Mom. This week, though, has been a hard week, just to be honest with you, with some prayer requests I want you to think about. If you notice, I'm doing the prayer requests, I'm doing the greeting, and I'm doing the giving talk today. Uh, that's because our youth pastor, Tracy Marsh, is not doing well. Um, he's been suffering from some issues back-wise. I think he went from gout to back for a couple weeks. And uh, you've seen him. He's winced in pain a little bit. Maybe you didn't know. 
but this week has been very bad. He's had some. Uh, he's had to go to the um, orthopedic doctor um, to check on his back, and it looks like he might have some degenerative issues in his discs in his back. So you pray for Tracy. He's not going to be able to be up. In fact, for those of you that are used to watching his youth videos, he's going to take a couple days off before he, he and hopefully he'll get better so he can shoot another one. But uh, he's going to have to take some time off from doing the youth videos. So uh, pray hard for him. I know there's other people that are hurting. This has been a tough week. I've had uh, some personal news, uh, not for me, but for other people that uh, hasn't gone the way they were hoping, and, and it was tragic news. And so there's some people in our church that are hurting um, uh, from, from bad news in their life. And so I would encourage you, uh, though we're not going to give out all the details to everybody's private life here, um, pray for one another. There are people that are hurting, and it wasn't a great week. I pray also for RC and Arzell as they're dealing with their daughters. Uh, RC's daughter has got the COVID-19, and so uh, we pray especially for her. She lives in Fayetteville, and, and anytime somebody has something like that, I think of uh, uh, those kind of situations, this is so tough. Pray for also for our elderly. I think of uh, pray for Judy and her family as they're making uh, decisions, and they're really having a hard time with the separation with Miss Loney. And, and pray for all the people that are in, shut in, in in situations like that, whether they're in nursing homes, convalescent homes, whatever. We want to pray for them in their time of need, uh, as that's a big one. Pray for also for those, uh, we've got church members that have lost their jobs, not just laid off temporarily, they've actually lost their jobs. Uh, and so pray for those. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the world when you lose your job. It may feel like it at times, and you may feel desperate, um, but... I'm telling you right now, God has a purpose and a plan, and all things, we believe that all things work together for good. God's good and our good. Um, it's, it's God's glory, our good. And so uh, we don't just say that around here. We really do believe that. And so pray for those kind of things going on, too. And then I know so many people are dealing with loneliness and, and other issues. You may think your issue is too small. We want to pray for it. Pray for those that have lost the family members over the last couple of weeks. Um, it's been a tough time, and it's hard to get over that. I don't want to forget those people. In fact, I think the farther, the, 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 the four or five weeks after the funerals or after they've passed on are some of the hardest times to get through because all the normal activities sort of get back to used to it and people forget about you. And so I want you to know right now we haven't forgot about you. And then I think also let's not forget to pray for these uh, mothers. Um, I think of Debbie Sweeney, um, and, and I'll just mention her. You know, she, she had her baby as we went into the social isolation time. She had her baby, and, and I'm, I'm sure it's been tough on her. Uh, reach out and pray for one another in those situations. Pray for the health of the baby. Um, pray for others. Uh, you know, the good news uh, that we've heard about others, uh, I think uh, Ben and Holly had their gender reveal this last week, as well as my son and his daughter. And, and so pray for these, uh, these children that are coming into this world. It's a tough time. And, and most of all, though, pray that God's kingdom is built. Uh, the, that's one of those, go back to that, uh, and I encourage you maybe sometime to sit down and read the Lord's Prayer again. Uh, maybe we'll do a study someday. But um, I would encourage you to um, go back and, and look into the Lord's Prayer. It talks about Jesus' kingdom being built. We need to make sure we're, we're always pushing God's kingdom first. So join with me in prayer this morning as we enter the presence of our God, because he's the only one that can take care of our needs. And if you have special needs, I know there are people that uh, have been uh, hospitalized. We uh, thank God for, for the results of, of what he's done for us. Um, I think uh, um, Hannah and Lucas had requested uh, prayer for a friend of hers. Uh, the dad had gotten, uh, I think he was a firefighter, and gotten uh, hospitalized. Pray for those kind of situations. I know uh, Crystal had posted uh, a need for a friend of hers that th just seems like one thing after another in their family has gone wrong. Um, just pray for those needs, and as we get them, we will post them either on social media if you ask us to, or uh, we'll try and mention them here um, and, and, and pass them along, even to those, uh, now you realize there are people that aren't on social media, so uh, pass them along to every, every person you can if you want prayer. Prayer is a, an outstanding tool, and it unifies us, but it also is what God has asked us to do in order to, uh, to connect with him and see his power displayed. So let's pray this morning and ask God to be part of this service as you uh, unite with us in prayer, and we ask for God's divine providence and blessing on the lives of those prayer requests and his glory be manifest amongst us. Let's pray. God, our, our God, our, our Father, thank you so much for 
all the, the wonder and splendor of, of springtime that you've given to us and the beautiful weather and, and, and days that were cooler than we expected and days that were more uh, beautiful than expected. We thank you for the rains that you brought and we thank you now for the warmer weather. And though we complain about the seasons, we know that they're all within your grasp and even uh, disasters, things like that, you've, you've allowed to happen for your glory. And so today we don't want to, if, if, if the, the seasons can praise you, God, we want to do a better job. Help us as we join with you this morning uh, in this time of praise and worship for you. Help us as we learn to unite uh, in our community of the church to do more for you. God, help us to, to build your body and not our own agendas. God, there's so many people that are going stir-crazy, have cabin fever. I pray that you would calm our fears and, and help us through this time. We pray for the many prayer requests that uh, we've just mentioned. We, we pray, first of all, that you would build your glory, your kingdom, through us. Help us to, to understand how you're moving and help us to draw closer to you. Help us in our mission that you've given us to uh, unite people in a relationship with you, to point you out, and help us as we who've been on that relationship, we move forward in that relationship. Help us not to sit in our holy behinds, but help us to get moving and, and do something in our lives for you. Because all the, the success of this earth won't matter if we didn't do anything to build your kingdom. So help us not to lay up treasures here on this earth. Help us not to, 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 to long for this earth. Help us to long for your kingdom. Help us to be good ambassadors. We pray for those that are discouraged this morning those that have gotten heartbreaking news, there, there are private matters that have gone out this week and, and uh, have, have had bad results, and you know they were coming back that way, and you designed it to be that way. Help us to understand your will and your way. God, I comfort the afflicted, and, and as we always say, afflict the comforted. God, help us to, to balance our lives for your glory. Help us to, in this time when we've been socially isolated, help us not to get so stir-crazy that we only think of ourselves, but help us to understand your plan and how it's coming forth. God, I can see your, your hand moving through all the things here at our church. So, God, I thank you for the way you've moved in our music ministry and worship. I thank you for the way you've moved in my life and you've moved in other people's. And I thank you for the, the fact that we've been able to reach out to more people, even around the world, than we ever would if we hadn't had this pandemic. God, I pray for those that are touched by this pandemic. Pandemic. I, I think especially today of R.C. and Arzell, it's their uh, family members. They have a family member who's got it. Uh, we think of Melissa Edwards and her family as, as they've had two cases that have not gone their way in their family. And God, I pray that others, as we, we, we know of others that, that have had it, that may, may not want everybody to know they have it, I pray that you would just comfort them. We think of those that are isolated, I think of uh, those elderly that are in uh, nursing homes and, and convalescent homes. We think of, uh, especially of, of Miss Loney and, and Judy and her family as they're dealing with that situation. So God, I pray that you'd reach out and tenderly help them know that you're still in charge. God, whatever your will is and however you display yourself, help us to not outthink you. Help us not to, to be your boss, but help you uh, I pray that you would be evident in our lives and that we'd be followers of you, not leaders of you. God, we thank you for the opportunities of, of worship today, and, and, and we don't want to take that for granted as we think about Tracy and his, uh, his condition right now and how he's not able to be with us here doing his normal thing. So, God, I pray that you physically would bring him back to health so he can continue doing ministry for you, be with his family, and be with all those. I, I pray for, for the graduates of the class of 2020 as they're facing this time and they're making decisions for their future. I pray that their future would include you. God, I thank you today, most importantly, though, for just being who you are and the fact that you loved us when we weren't lovable and that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. So, God, I pray that you'd bless this time today. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name.
Years ago, when I was in college, uh, there was one Christmas, my sister came by, and she picked me up, and we all went down to my parents' house. My dad was pastoring in the Outer Banks, Kill Devil Hills, North Carolina, and we were going to spend Christmas together. In fact, my oldest brother and his wife and two kids were there, and, and my middle brother and his wife, and, and then me and my sister, we all got there, into the, and we were going to stay for just a short amount of time in a very tight, confined little house. Um, just to celebrate Christmas and then go our separate ways. Well, what happened was disastrous because in that Christmas, and I don't remember what year it was, it was like 1990 or or 91, um, probably 1990, that Christmas there was a record snowfall on the Outer Banks. We woke up that morning, that, that next morning, to over 18 inches of snow. Now, for some of you guys, you're automatically thinking, why is he talking about snow? The weather's changed. We're, we're starting to get hot weather now. It wasn't the weather that was the important problem. It was the fact that there was a lot of people pushed together in a small house in tight confines, and the Outer Banks had zero, zero, that is the, the, the number lower than one, zero snow removal equipment. There was no salt, no sand, no, no plow trucks, nothing. And so here we were, not expecting snow. In fact, I didn't even bring a heavy coat. I wasn't planning on going anywhere. We were just staying for a short amount of time because I needed to get back. I had a light jacket with me because I didn't want to overpack. In fact, I didn't pack many clothes at all. Neither did anybody. And we were stuck in this house for days. It was a disaster. And what became more of a disaster is, you know, when you're in tight confines, because right now probably some of you parents can, can identify with this, there's nowhere to go. 
There's nothing to do. And kids get squabbly. I remember my niece and my nephew were pretty young at the time. They had two Disney videos that they kept wanting to watch over and over again. And I could only take so much of those Disney videos. And you know how it is, and, and it's, it's even more compact. And I think about situations like that. I think about you guys as we're going through this time of social distancing and isolation where some of you feel a little stir-crazy. Hang in there. You say, what's this got to do with today's topic? Well, I was thinking about, too, one of the, the breakdowns in relationships comes when we don't base our relationships on truth, when lies get involved. You think about it. Uh, I, in fact, I give you a biblical illustration of what I'm talking about. There was a guy who was born a twin. His name was Jacob. And Jacob, if you didn't know, means deceiver, supplanter. Basically, we would say liar, liar, pants on fire. Jacob, he comes out of the womb. His parents named him that. And I, I was thinking, as, a, as you name a baby, why would you name your kid liar? Why would you name him deceiver? That's something he's going to live up to. And certainly Jacob did. He spent most of his youth, his early days, deceiving his brother to the point where he drove his brother so angry towards him and ruined that relationship to the point where his brother wanted to murder him. And so Jacob ended up having to leave town. And that's not really what we're speaking on today. But what I want to do is I want you to see the problem where ruined relationships are a result sometimes of deception or lies. You know, Jesus understood that so clearly in his last moments and really throughout his whole ministry, but he really wanted to make sure we understood it in his last moments with his disciples right before he's going to be betrayed and crucified. And as we are in this series now, Community, where we believe that we is greater than me, we've explained in week our first session that prayer is the building block for how we build unity in the church. We said in week two that our purpose is really the glory of God. And so when we live the glory of God in our lives, we give it back to God, and that's a building block for unity in the church. This week we're going to talk about truth. And you know, when, I, when we talk about truth, Jesus in his, his sermon here, or his prayer here, um, and not a sermon, his prayer here, the last group prayer that he has with these disciples before he's crucified, he gives us several themes that we've been talking about, and truth is one of them. And I want to point out, and, and, and I know sometimes you're like, why don't you read the whole passage? It's a lengthy passage. We're going to point out several key verses in this passage. I, I would uh, encourage you in your time throughout the next, really the next 30 days, take time. You can read the whole entire chapter, John 17, about six minutes. If you're a slower reader, maybe eight minutes. It will change your life. You read that every day for the next 30 days. Jesus, though, he prayed, and, and I want to highlight four verses real quick and, and as we move into what we're talking about today. Jesus said this in John chapter 17, verse number 6. He says it this way, and remember, Jesus is praying to his Father, God the Father. So when he says I, he's talking about himself, and when he says you, he's not talking about disciples, he's talking about God the Father. So he prays this prayer, and he says in verse number 6, I have revealed you. I have revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. Now, that would be his disciples, and really it's a reference also to us, but we're going to specifically uh, reference that to the disciples there with him. He says, I have revealed you. Now, that's one of those, those terms uh, that we could, we could say it's revealed is a way you find out truth. Sometimes truth is revealed to us. By the way, we discover truth. We do not create truth. I want to be clear on that uh, as we move forward. Um, I cannot create truth because it wouldn't be true if I created it. Truth exists outside of me. I don't make it happen inside of me. And that's a, a big premise there. We've talked about this before. But what Jesus is declaring in his prayer as he prays to God the Father is he's declaring the source of what he's telling them. He's revealing God to them. He says, I've revealed you. That's revelation. Now, we're not talking about revelation as in the last book in the Bible. He's talking about, I'm revealing what you are, who you are. So basically, Jesus says in his prayer, for the last three and a half years, as I've traveled with these disciples, I have revealed who you are. I've given them who you are. I've told the truth about who you are. I've tried to unite them to you. It's that transitive property that we talk about in, in mathematics, you know, uh, and I'm that math guy, where A if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. That's the transitive property, basically. What it's saying is, if, if I know you, God, and they know me, then I have gotten them to where they know you, God. That's how Jesus puts it here. He says, I've revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. 
And, and then he says, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. That's what it leads to. That's the, uh, the projection there. He skipped down a couple of verses in verse number 8. He says this, For I have given them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Now, they didn't just receive it. They weren't, it wasn't just revealed. They accepted it. Okay, They accepted those words. They knew with, with certainty. Notice the language there. Um, uh, they knew with certainty that I came from you, and, I, the, uh, and they believed that you sent me. Okay? That's what he says there. He says, I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. That's the whole idea. Skip down to verse number 14. He continues on by saying this. He says, I have given them your word. And now they've, they've not just accepted it, they've received it, and it's in them. And he says, and the world has hated them, has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Truth and lies are divisive. They are. It's just like light and darkness. You can't have light and darkness existing in the same point. You're either going to have light or you're going to have darkness. You're either going to have truth or you're going to have lie. And I know some people are saying, well, that's so black and white. It is. That's what he's saying here. And he's saying, because you have your word in these disciples, they have been marginalized. They've been hated. And it's not any, any reality there because they've been translated by your truth. They've been changed by your truth into something different because they're no longer of the world any more than I'm of the world. And he's going to prove that in his resurrection and ascension in the, in the following days, weeks, and, and, and time with his disciples. And then, of course, the, the last verse I want to look at, verse number 17, that, that fits in with this. And this is probably the most well-known out of, out of all the verses in John chapter 17. He says this, sanctify them by the truth. Now, that word sanctify, the word sanctify simply means to set apart for a special purpose, to consecrate, to, to have a purpose in mind. And, and he's asking, after he goes through all the facts that, they, that Jesus has revealed God to them, they've accepted God, God's in them. They're no longer who they were because now they're not part of the world. They're part of God's world. And he says this, take them and use them for a special, special purpose by the truth. Use that truth to separate them. Make them truthful is what he's saying. And then he finishes it up with that all-important statement. He says, your word, God's word, is truth. God's word is truth. And, and what we have to realize, um, and I was, I was thinking this thing as we go through this, individuals, um, and, and the mission of Maple, let me start there. The mission of Maple Springs, and I've said this over and over again until I, hopefully you're going to get so tired that you say it. Then I'll know you know it. But the mission of Maple is to help all people at the various stages of their relationship with Jesus Christ move forward in that relationship along that life's journey, that life's path in their travels with Jesus. <clears throat> and that's important here because that's really what you understand. Now, as we do that, that realize there are some people that haven't begun their journey. There are some people who have been on their journey with Jesus for a long time. But everybody in that group, everybody in that group, that includes the pastor, everybody, the oldest to the youngest person, everybody needs to move along in their journey with Jesus. Now, as we look into this, what we have to realize, if we're going in this, we are all at different points in this starting point. We may have similar backgrounds, we may have similar identifiers, we may have similar uh, uh, beliefs and thoughts, we may have studied or been saved for a certain amount of time, and, and, but each one of us is uniquely different. We've talked about those differences in our Maple Minute, but we are so uniquely different, we're at different starting points in our travels with Jesus, and that's so important, because what we want to do is everyone wants to get to the same destination, and the, the idea behind getting to the same destination is in order for me to get to the correct destination, I have to use a map. <laughs> That's true. Or let's put it like this, I have to use a GPS because we don't use maps as much these days as we use the GPS in our phones. And that's important. Now, I remember in the early days of GPS, I was going to a conference with a friend down in Kissimmee, Florida, or well, for those of you who don't, don't know, it's, it's Kissimmee, not Kissimmee. Kissimmee. Um, it's Kissimmee, Florida. Um, that's one of those weird towns right outside of uh, Disney area. We were going to a conference, and we had laid out in a GPS system where we were going, and, you know, it took us to the wrong destination. 
our map wasn't reliable. In fact, we were late to our conference a little bit, um, which really upsets me. I don't like to be late for things, um, but it really upset me. And that day, we were late. And I, I, I remember we talked about it in the car, and, and the guy I was with, he, we remarked how we didn't trust all the GPS. And you know, if your, your map or your GPS is going to be accurate, it has to be based on reality. And that's one of those things. A map, if you look at a map, it's got to have points on it that are real. It doesn't help me to have some kind of fake map that doesn't, and, and really, to be able to read a map, I've got to have those reference points. I don't know if you've ever had someone draw you a map. I, I've drawn maps for people, and people look at me like, huh? I'm not a map drawer. Don't let me do that. I, I know where places are, but I'm not Mr. Give you a map. Uh, maybe you're great at drawing maps, but man, maps are important. Because a map really helps us get to the same place, but it has to be based on reality. See, a map or a GPS system, it defines the roads which we have to be taken to reach a certain destination. And we probably aren't all on the same different path. We're probably on different paths going to this destination because our journeys are different with Jesus. No two of us are exactly alike. But the destination's the same, and so we want to find the right path. And how do we do that? Well, let me give you this, and this is the money statement for the, for the beginning here. <clears throat> An increasing love for God's truth is the only infallible path to unity. That's what Jesus is trying to get us to understand here. An increasing love for God's truth, or God's word, we could say it that way, is the only infallible path to unity. How do we get along? You know why churches fight? They fight over things. You know, most churches don't fight over doctrine. You know what they fight over? They fight over things like pews versus chairs. They fight over color of carpets. They fight over what kind of music's in the church. They fight over what we're wearing. Um, they fight over the, the color of paint. They fight over dumb things. And you know what Jesus is trying to get us to understand here? The importance of unity, and it's found through the map of his truth, his word. You see, without truth, relationships fall apart. We said this already. My wife and I, in our relationship, if I start lying, deceiving my wife, what's going to happen in our relationship is our relationship's going to fall apart. Same for her. See, there is an expectation in relationships of truth. And one of the things that the church has been problematic with over the last, well, probably since man got involved with God's church, is there have been times when truth has failed. There have been, uh, you think about it in that first, first church in Acts, there was a couple who lied to the Holy Spirit. They lied about some property they had sold, and they kept some of the money. They gave some of it to make themselves more important, but they kept a portion of the money, and then they lied about it. And what happens is the Holy Spirit kills them. Now, I'm not saying that as a reference that you ought to die or anything like that. I'm just saying what is the important fact we're trying to pull out is truth was important in the relationship in that first church. And I think God wanted everybody to understand that. One of the Ten Commandments from the Old Testament under the old uh, law was the fact that you, uh, you should not lie. And, and if you look into that law, a liar wasn't just somebody like, shame on you, you lied. They would take you out and stone you. They had no tolerance for that. Tell the truth. And that's one of those things we understand. Relationships fall apart when there are lies or deceit in them. And that's what Jesus is trying to help us understand here. He's trying to help us understand that the path to unity is by the roadmap of God's truth, which is his word. Now, they obviously didn't have a Bible to sit back and open up those days. Most of what they had would have been what we call the Jewish Bible or the Jewish scriptures. That would be the Old Testament. That was enough for them to get God's word. But what he's really referring to is the fact that they need to follow his teachings, his word. He has laid out his teachings for them. And it was so clear that most of these men, they, uh, you, you find a lot of these followers had written different books in the New Testament recording Jesus' word. That's what it was all about. And so when Jesus is uttering his final group prayer, he was lifting up a map that would lead to unity. And that's what we're trying to understand today. Because in, in our mission of helping people so obviously the church of today and you can see it through their fightings even amongst this virus issue they're fighting about reopen or don't reopen and and i think what a horrible testimony they're making to the unsaved world because of the way they're acting towards each other and towards the government 
They're not promoting Jesus. They're promoting their own, their own issues. And, and here's what I would say. Hey, you know what? We need to get the roadmap out for God's unity, which is his truth. God's truth. See, a lot of times we sit back and we worry about what we think, what we believe, what we, we, we know. It's not about what I know. It's about what Jesus knows. See, in this prayer, Jesus uses the, the term your word three times, and once he says the words you gave to me. And so when you see this four times, he's talking about God's word, God's word, God's word. He's putting an importance on this truth. He's putting an importance on it. He says there in verse 8 and verse 14 that God's word is what he has given them. See, so often we want what the world wants. See, Jesus came and did a lot of miracles. You can read through a lot of these healings and, and just amazing miracles. He starts there in Canaan of Galilee and turns water into wine, and he feeds 5,000 at one point. He feeds 4,000 at one point. He raises uh, people from the dead. He heals the blind. He makes the lame to walk. He, 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 he causes deaf to hear. And we sit back and go, wow, that's cool, that's cool. And we love to hear about those. But Jesus says, hey, you know what? The importance I'm giving you is not miracles. I'm not here to feed you. I'm not here to, to do, do amazing tricks for you. I'm not here to, possess your, uh, to, to, to oppress you with power. I'm here to give you God's word. I'm here to make sure you understand the truth of God's word. He wasn't here to do away. He says that early on in, in his uh, Sermon on the Mount. He says, I'm not here to do away with the Old Testament. I'm here to make sure it's clear. I want to make sure you know. I was thinking about this. Uh, we, we spent time last fall in a series talking about the, the children of Israel and how they lived in Egypt for over 400 years. You know the problem? In 400 years, the people of Israel didn't really know who God was. They had lost connection with him. They had lost his word. They had lost, so they lost who he was. And so the first thing that Moses does as he takes them out and they cross over that Red Sea, where they go? They go to Mount Sinai to worship God and to receive his word, his commandments. And the reason they had to receive those commandments wasn't they needed a list of rules to do. They needed to know who he was. And that is best explained through the laws of Moses. And that's what Jesus has been trying to do for the last three and a half years of ministry with these disciples. And that's what he's praying. He wants us to understand, and that's what truth does. It helps us understand what God's word is. See, God's word is what he had given them. Remember in John chapter 14, Jesus says, hey, you know what? Thomas asks, uh, or Philip asked that question. He says, how can we know who the father is? And Jesus basically says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. What he's saying here is, I have shown you the Father. I've represented him. And that's what Jesus is praying once again. In verse number 6, he's telling them that God's word is what they have obeyed. And he's talking about the, the need for truth. See, it's not just good enough to know truth, but if we don't follow it, and that's one of our problems today. Sometimes we don't follow truth, and so when we don't follow truth, and this is where you find churches falling apart, we don't follow truth we, or obey truth, we don't have that unity that Jesus is talking about. He says in verse 17, what we just read there, he tells us that God's word is what will set us apart too. That's what the truth is. I think so many churches are losing who they are because they're worried about whether they have better entertainment, whether they have better comedians, whether they have better um, smoke, mirrors, bands, things like that. And once again, I've said this before, there's nothing wrong with all these things, but if they're replacing what God's truth is with them, then we have a problem. See, the, the truth is today, we're gathered here not to entertain you. We're gathered here to encompass the truth in our lives so that we can know God closer, so that we can worship him. This is a worship service, and we worship by getting to know the truth. And God here in verse 17, or Jesus here in verse 17 is praying that we would be chosen, we would be set apart, not because of what we wear, not because of what we sing, not because of what we play, not because of how we, we sit, not because of the, the building we're in. Those are all good things, but he's saying they'll be set apart for a purpose when they are set apart by truth. And that's what sets us apart is the truth. You see, the reason I'm different than the average person that lives in Ashboro or Seagrove is because I believe in the truth of Jesus Christ. And that's the truth for you too. He says also that God's word is a definer of all that can be rightly called truth. And that's the, the, the building block. 
He, he makes it very clear, and you say, well, that's very narrow-minded. And I know that's something that offends people in this generation, but let me just tell you. All truth, and I said this in our Maple Minute the other day, all truth is God's truth because God is truth. See, modern-day philosophers want to tell you, young people especially, they want to tell you, if you want to go the path of science, if you want to, if you want to be a scientist, a doctor, something like that, you're not going to be able to be a Christian because Christianity and science are opposites. That's not true at all. You know, the, the Bible, though it is not a science book, it is scientifically accurate. You know, the Bible, though it's not a history book, is historically accurate. You can try and prove it wrong, but it's, it's not going to be proven wrong. It, it, that's the hard part about it. And when we get into this word, what we know here is that all truth is God's truth. And he's saying, hey, what makes us special is when we understand the truth and apply it to our lives. Why do we say that? Just look around. <laughs> Just look around. Turn on the news, and what you're going to find is one candidate is exploiting the other candidate because he was a liar. We have congressmen that are lying about their, their use of, of the knowledge about the coronavirus and how they could profit from it. We've got uh, Democratic candidates who are lying about different things to cover up. We've got, uh, we've got all kinds of lies. In fact, that's scandal after scandal after scandal, and, and I don't know if we're ever going to get out of this. Because it's just a, a set scheme that we've been doing for years now. Years and years and years, uh, we're, we've been sitting back looking at scandal after scandal. Why? Because there's been deceit. Think about Bill Clinton when he, he sat back and he lied to the public that he did not have sex with Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> and then he wanted to change his tune a little bit when it started coming back on him. It, it's, it's lie after lie, and I'm not trying to get political on you today. That's not my, my idea. What I'm saying is we live in a world that is not based upon truth. The culture of today doesn't define themselves by truth. And God's saying, hey, Jesus is praying, if you want to be unified, be unified around the map that guides you through life. It's the truth. See, Jesus, knowing his departure would be the following day, he turns his attention of his friends to the authority which will be with him when he is gone. Have you ever considered that? Jesus is going to leave them, and he says, hey, you need a map. You need a guide. Now, he's going to send the Holy Spirit into our lives when he leaves, but he, he was telling them, listen, the, the map is truth. The guide is truth. And Jesus, as he prays this high priestly prayer, he prays for them and for us that we would know the word of God. And not just that we would know it, because knowing isn't enough. That we would obey the word of God. And, and more so than just obeying, he doesn't want us just to be obedient robots. He wants us to be changed. That's what he talked about. If you, think, you go back to those verses we read, he talks about knowing God and then obeying God and then being changed by God and then it leads to us filtering all of our thoughts through God's word, through his truth. See, Jesus, he didn't just pray this prayer. He modeled this in his life. Seven times throughout John's gospel, John uses the term about Jesus' hour being come or not come. And, and when you go back and you look through it, what you find here is Jesus models his purpose, his truth, by using that statement. Jesus, early on in John chapter 7, verse 30, and in John chapter 8, verse 20, Jesus uh, uses the, the uh, time periods where people are trying to use him for different purposes to promote uh, what they wanted or they were angry with him. And Jesus basically knows the truth, and because he knows the truth, and here's what the truth will do for you. When you know the truth, nothing can distract you. And that's what Jesus did. You remember early on in Jesus' ministry, we talked about this before, Jesus is taken into the wilderness to be tempted uh, of the devil. And Jesus uses God's truth, his word, to fight those temptations because nothing could distract him. Not only that, when you live according to the truth, Jesus proved this, nothing can destroy you. <laughs> nothing can take you out. Nothing can, can destroy you uh, in, 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 in this thinking, too. When you live according to God's purpose, God's truth in this map of life, nothing can discourage you. In fact, over in John chapter 16, in verse number 32, Jesus had talked about the fact that, that uh, uh, he was telling his disciples that they would, uh, they're, they're, the, through the betrayal, that they would all scatter, and they'd leave him alone, and he'd be all by himself, but the Father wouldn't leave him alone. And he, what he was saying here is the truth of God and his, his word, the Father's word to him, would always be there so he wouldn't have to be discouraged. 
Jesus understood this, and he realized when you live by the truth, nothing can disappoint you either. I think so often we have stock mar- people that are disappointed because stock markets rise and fall, because economies rise and fall. And you know what? If we just base ourselves on the truth of God's word, we don't have to worry about that. And ultimately, when we get to John chapter 17 and verse number 1, and we, we spoke on this a couple weeks ago, and Jesus says, my hour has come, Glor- let me glorify you, God, as you glorify me. Um, that's basically what he says there in verse 1. And what he's saying is he's saying, hey, nothing can defeat you when you live according to the truth. See, he wasn't saying that as he's looking forward to the cross thinking, oh me, oh my, I'm, a, I'm not going to make it. What he's saying here is, I'm going to glorify you by dying on this cross, and then I want you to glorify me, and we're going to glorify each other. And that's the, we talked about the great glory in the last uh, message of the series, but I want you to understand nothing can defeat you when you live according to this truth. And Jesus knew even the shadow of the cross looming over him would not defeat him because he was following the plan, the path for truth. See, God's God's, uh, people who use truth as their map, their guide for life, follow the plan that God has for us that we're to come together with himself and others. See, using God's truth as a map towards Christian unity is the answer to Jesus' prayer. That's the greatest appeal of us. That's what he says, hey, when I'm praying this prayer for you to make it and to unify, what I'm saying here is follow the map. And, And then what we need to do is distinguish and prioritize the essential truths in Scripture that are key to unity. That helps us in this this issue. We're we're to take the essential truths of Scripture and we're identify them, and that's why we come together in in our times uh, of of worship services and we edify one another, not based upon stories, though I tell some stories from time to time. It's not really the stories that are important. It's God's truth that's important because God's essential key truths, that's the key to our unity, getting us all on the same page. You know, I always try and leave you with this one thought, and let me leave it with you. Using God's word correctly will bring about the unity that Jesus was praying for, and that's the bottom line. Using God's, did you get that? Using God's word correctly will bring about the unity Jesus was praying for. So if that's the only thing you got today, here's the questions we have to ask ourselves. Am I a student of God's word? Do I know God through his truth? Have I obeyed God through his truth? Am I connecting to God, and is it changing me? And is it, am I filtering all my thoughts, all my intents through God's truth? When we get down to it, the reality is, how am I handling God's truth today? Let me challenge you. Maybe, uh, and, and there again, maybe you're not a Christ follower. I would, I would challenge you to look into the truth claims today of Jesus Christ. Take God's word. Take take a copy of the Bible and search out to see what truth is there. Hey, you know what? You can sit back and you can look at Christians and, and, and take their lives apart and find that they weren't always right. But take God's word. Jesus is the example I want you to look into. We as Christ followers, maybe it's time we need to examine how much of the truth we're putting into our lives. I think so often we put a lot more Facebook into our lives and a lot more Instagram into our lives or Snapchat or whatever social media we use than we do God's Word. The psalmist in Psalm 119 was very clear when he said, your word is a light into my path, a lamp into my feet. He understood that we're going to stumble if we don't have God's Word to guide us. It's GPS for our souls. It helps guide us. And if that's the truth, When was the last time you looked at the reality of God's word and put it daily into your life, put it into practice? You you acquired it so much in your life that it was not just knowing it, it wasn't just obeying it, it was changing you. Maybe you need to be changed by God's word. So let me challenge you for the next seven days. Take God's word. Spend time. In fact, I would encourage you, as we've been looking into the Maple Minute in John, Start in the Gospel of John. Start reading John through. Taking time, and you don't have to read huge chapters. Read small portions and understand it. Ask questions. Research and find out what it means. And then ask God to illuminate your mind and change your heart. God's word is the only hope we have 
for moving forward in our mission in life. It's the basis for what we do here at Maple Springs. Without it, we're lost. Take time this week to follow God's word. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. And we thank you for the fact that it's what unifies us as a church. We aren't unified by songs. We aren't unified by dramas. We aren't unified by pews or by outfits or by anything else. We're not even unified under denominationalism. What we're unified under is your word. So God, help us to put your word in our hearts. As the psalmist said, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So God, today, we know for our young people, the only way we'll be able to make it in life is by taking and listening to your word. So help us to do that. God, we know the only way as adults we'll be able to change our lives and follow those plans that we need for our, our lives is by putting your lamp, your word is our lamp, before our feet. So help us today to do that. Guide us and help us in this time of isolation to know your will and your word, not be following our thinking, not be following our own ways, but follow you and your word. Thank you for loving us and thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held me. supporting God's mission, not supporting me necessarily, but supporting God's mission. 
You're honoring God by being more like him. When we're generous, we're so much like Jesus. And I understand sometimes it's not easy to give. Before, actually, I talk about giving, I want to read a passage of Scripture to you from Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. The Bible says, as Jesus looked up, he saw, rich, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw the poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, the, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of the poverty put in all that she had to live on. You know, to be honest with you, this story isn't very easy for me to like. Why? <laughs> because it hurts my wallet. Jesus is making a point here that giving should require sacrifice, and I think that's one of the hardest lessons to learn, especially in America. You may be feeling like you don't have much, but we really do. See, this giving out of sacrifice is not a fun principle to think about. <laughs> in my own life, I found it, it's not... <clears throat> it's not difficult to be like the rich people uh, in this story. See, I give what's easy for me to give. I give when it doesn't hurt. On the other hand, Jesus praises this widow above all the other people that he's seeing there uh, at the temple. She's without a husband, and apparently she doesn't have very much to live on, <clears throat> yet she still gives to God. Think of the sacrifice that would take. In fact, she doesn't just give to God. The Bible says that she gave all that she had to live on. That's the kind of sacrifice that honors God. See, I don't want to come across as manipulative by any means, but I want you to see what Jesus said was important in our giving attitudes. And even though uh, this is something that uh, uh, is true in, in the Bible, I'm not trying to manipulate you to give more than you can. What I'm trying to do is, is let you see how Jesus views generosity. So here's what I want you to do with this story. I want you to think about it and, and give as you normally would give, but think about it throughout this week. Think about it throughout uh, your, your uh, time, in your own devotional time, and, and see what God wants to do through you in this message that he speaks there. Maybe you need to study more in Luke chapter 21. I think about even David. David, at one point in his life, as he's the king, he comes to a place where he's trying to stop a problem in the in the uh, a plague, <clears throat> and he needs to make a sacrifice. And so he offers to buy land from a, a guy. And the man comes to him and says, "No, you're the king. Let me give it to you." And, G and David says, "No, no, no. I, I won't worship God without sacrificing." And that's one of those truths that I think we need to embrace. I'm not saying you have to go penniless and God doesn't want you to be broke all the time, but I think we ought to, to, to give out of deep needs, which gives us a mindset that we need to follow. And I'm so glad that we have people in our church that are following. I know several of you don't have jobs or you haven't worked, and I appreciate the fact that you've been faithful in your giving. And let me, let me never take that for granted. It is good that you are doing that. I just always want to remind us how Jesus thinks and what he's talking about with his own disciples who didn't have very much, but he still talked to him about generosity, and it's important for us. As we move forward, uh, I'm so thankful that our church has, has met our goal for the, the Annie Armstrong. And once again, let me encourage you in the future, maybe you need to give uh, smaller amounts on a weekly basis or biweekly basis or monthly basis in order to be able to contribute that. Um, I know uh, it's easier to do that for us. And so my wife and I, both for the Annie Armstrong, uh, the, the uh, North American Missions Board, offering and the international uh, missions offering, we take up small amounts uh, on, a, a, on a biweekly basis as we get our paychecks. So there is a lot of ways to do that. Let me also encourage you, if you don't know how to give during this time, uh, you can mail them into the church. Um, you can drop them off at the church. I'm here uh, six days a week, and, uh, and honestly, uh, we're right next door too, so seven days a week, we don't really go anywhere. Um, and so uh, if you need to drop them off at the parsonage, uh, uh, you'll see our cars usually there, my wife's home, uh, or <clears throat> sometimes I'm home, but uh, um, you can always drop them off there. And then uh, uh, we have the Tithely app. It's, uh, if you've never tried that out, and you say, you repeat yourself all the time, but I just want to make sure you understand the options we have. Um, the Tithely app is just for your convenience, um, and, and my wife loves it. Uh, we're, we've been used to online giving uh, for years, and so um, if you go to tithe, T-I-T-H-E dot L-Y, um, uh, you can go there on the internet, there's an app button, you can download the app on your phone from the app store, 
and that's pretty easy to understand. Thank you for, for being generous during this time of separation. Um, it would be easy for people, since we're, since we're not together, to say, well, you know, what I don't see, I don't do. And so uh, it would be easy for people to ignore giving, but you haven't ignored God. And that's still an important thing. And so the ministry is still going forward here at Maple. And we look forward to a time that we will all be together. Um, don't know when that's going to be yet. Um, it's going to be a little while still. We're still under the, uh, the orders from the state. Um, and, and they're good orders right now. I think it's, it's wise to not rush into things. So we're taking our time. We're being wise. Um, it probably, uh, if a lot of people ask me, when do you see us getting back together and having services? I think uh, it'll probably be after we get through into phase two, maybe uh, down the road. So we're probably looking somewhere in June, beginning of June, um, hopefully, to get back together and having normal services, somewhat normal services. It still won't be normal. Um, there'll be a lot of limitations. But um, just so you know, I'm trying to give you something to plan on. Um, and that still means we won't be doing our normal, um, our normal activities. Um, so uh, hopefully down the road, uh, we'll be able to include some more things. But I'm excited for it. Don't get discouraged in well-doing is what the Bible teaches us. Because in due season, we'll reap if we don't faint. That's what Paul said. And so we're going to encourage you with that. Thanks for your faithfulness. Let me pray for the blessing on those that have been giving and those that are looking into giving and help, hope to encourage you. God, we thank you for all you do for us. We thank you how you provide. That you, you talk about how you look after the flowers of the field, the grass of the field, and the birds of the air, and how much more important are we to you. And so, God, we thank you that you are a God who, who overwhelmingly is generous with us, so much to the point that you were generous enough to sacrifice your own son for us, while we were enemies of yours, you gave us your son to die on the cross, to sacrifice his all, and his rights as the king to cover for our sins. So we don't ever want to take that lightly. We thank you for your generosity. Thank you for inviting us not just to be uh, slaves, but you've invited us to be heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You've invited us to be uh, adopted into your family with all the benefits and blessings. And God, you have blessed us more than most people. And so we thank you for being a great father to us, being a, a, a Lord and Savior to us, being a God who directs us and guides us. And, and you do own the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth of every mine. And, and so we know that our gifts don't really make you any richer, but they do help us to be more like you. And so help us to be generous, generous to our fellow man, generous to our neighbors, generous to people in our church that are in need. So God, I want to bless those who've been faithful in their giving. Bless the people of Maple. They've been so generous towards helping out in a world that's lost. When other people are thinking selfish needs and about their, their needs and their opportunities, the people of Maple have been thinking about your kingdom to be built. And so I thank you for those people who are generous. God, help us by giving us the gifts we, ha we, we can use to, to glorify you and build your kingdom. We thank you for supplying our needs. We thank you for opportunities that challenge us, too. Think of this, this widow. As she didn't have a husband to provide for, she didn't have a family, she didn't have much, but she gave it all. She sacrificed. And so I thank you for challenging us to sacrifice. Giving means so much more when we sacrifice. So God, help us to be sacrificial in our giving. Thank you, though, for supplying everything, and thank you for being the King of kings, the Lord of lords. So God, bless this offering Bless the gift and the giver, and may they all be used to your glory and your benefit and your building of your kingdom. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's precious and holy name.